To begin with, here are the learning outcomes from this lecture. We want you to be A, familiar with the concept of analysis and where analysis fits in the software development life cycle. Secondly, we want you to be familiar with techniques for analysis. And thirdly, we want you to be familiar with the work products that, that are typically used for, for capturing the results of, of your analysis. So analysis is, analysis is all about understanding. Uh, understanding by separating the target of the analysis into its component parts and component aspects, understanding the static structure of the thing that you're analyzing. And note, I'm just saying thing for now, because I'll define thing later. Uh, understanding the static structure, understanding the dynamic behavior of the thing that you're under that of the thing that you're analyzing, and then capturing this, capturing this understanding, uh, either in documents, using um, English or using specialized notation such as UML, or capturing this understanding tacitly, that is, in shared understanding among the people working on the team. In order to understand something, you usually have to know its context and perhaps the context of that context. In other words, analysis usually needs to be done at multiple levels. Three common levels of analysis are, firstly, of a domain. A domain is a well-defined area in which the enterprise operates and in which the software system plays a role. You can also think of a domain as perhaps a subcomponent of the value chain of the enterprise. The second level is, is that of the problem. In other words, you need to understand what needs to be addressed or achieved in the domain. And then finally, you have to understand the solution, which is how you might solve the problem or achieve the goal. So when you're talking about a software system, what are the things that you might analyze? Well, the first thing you might analyze is the domain in which the software system is supposed to play a role in. Okay, So for example, um, if you were building an insurance application, you might analyze the insurance domain. Um, you know, what is insurance? Who are the customers? Uh, what are the different types of insurance? What are the uh, different types of customers? Um, how do they typically make their ins insurance buying decisions? Uh, what are the competitive forces playing within an insurance industry? All those different things about the domain. Okay, this is known as domain analysis. And if you and actually you did a good part of what falls under domain analysis in the business analysis part of of your project. Okay, and the you know the the, the first module in this in this course was all about business an analysis. Putting it in software engineering terms, it was all about domain analysis. Now sometimes you will see a term known, uh, known as a domain model. Well, in software engineering, it has become somewhat a tradition to capture the, stra the static structure of a domain using a UML model and that model is called a domain model. Uh, here's an example of a domain model. So it looks like it's the domain model of um, the, the buying process um, within a store. So you have an item in a store, you have registers in a store, you have um, you have a single sales line item that records the sale of an item. You have a sale that consists of multiple line, you know, sales line items. You have a payment that you make for a sale, um, you know, and you can see here the associations, attributes, uh, domain objects, you know, cardinalities, things like that. Essentially, I'm looking in in, in this particular case. It looks like the the analyst um, went into a store or went, you know. Uh, is is analyzing the the retail store domain and is capturing these objects and their relationships in in a domain model. Here is a part of a domain model that shows a dynamic behavior in the domain. In this case, it is the process by which a customer buys an item and the store consequently makes a sale. Note that a couple of the classes here overlap with the model with the object with the class model of the static structure shown on the previous slide but also that some classes in this picture do not overlap with the classes in the other object model. This happens because the class or object model has been derived separately from the, the, the sequence diagram, which is the dynamic model. 
this is this is done deliberately so that there's a chance to cache any errors in either model by comparing the two if one model were derived from the other we wouldn't have this validation opportunity now let's say that you analyze the domain and you identified a problem that you'd like to solve in that domain well you might want to analyze that problem in some depth and that analysis is called problem analysis Basically, you're trying to understand the problem to be solved. To do this, you want to identify and relate the objects or things and or classes that exist in the problem. These objects or classes make up the static structure of the problem and can be represented in an object or class diagram. Next, you want to capture the dynamic behavior of the problem. You could do this by using one of the UML diagrams for capturing dynamic behavior, such as a sequence collaboration activity or state diagram. Note that you could also just use plain text, either independently or in conjunction with the other diagrams. Here is an example component of a problem analysis. Here we have just reused a piece of the domain model and annotated it with a description of the problem. And then once you understood the problem, well, you might want to come up with a solution to solve that problem. Analyzing or understanding what that solution should be is known as solution analysis. Note here the progression from understanding to solving. So the domain analysis is understanding at a high level. The problem, under, problem analysis is understanding at a lower level. The solution analysis is now trying to understand the solution. We don't quite call it design yet because when you do solution analysis, what you're interested in is thinking of the system as a black box and considering how the the actors in a system might solve the problem by interacting with the system at the system boundary. So solution analysis never goes beyond the system boundary, it just talks about how the users, the actors may interact with the system to solve the problem while staying at the at the boundary of the system. Here is an example of a piece of solution analysis. Here we are planning to replace the existing manual checkout system with a self-checkout system, and now we are analyzing that. Once again, note the skin depth of the analysis. That is, we only show the interactions at the level of the interface of the system. Incidentally, the system in this case is the box titled checkout system. There is also a corresponding piece of solution analysis consisting of object or class models. Here also, we only need to show objects that are, ex that are exchanged or visible at the interface. In the system, the objects or classes identified from the solution analysis are item, shelf, and receipt. So if you notice in the previous slides, I've asked you to do domain problem and solution analysis. And in each case, I've asked you to identify scenarios. Well, scenarios are the first step towards um, identifying the dynamic behavior of a system. So that's what scenarios are all about. They are work products uh, used to capture the dynamic behavior. Well, um, when you, so, so I'm just going to give you a, a, a short uh, note on solution scenarios, but you should think of other scenarios, problem scenarios and domain scenarios as sort of similar. Uh, well, a solution scenario is an elaboration is an elaboration of a use case. So, in other words, you're providing more detail about a use case, uh, and you can think of a scenario as um, describing one path through a use case. Uh, remember, once again, I'm describing a solution scenario as an elaboration of one path through a use case, and actually, when you describe your solution, when you describe the requirements of your of your solution. Um, there's a trade-off here. So you can either have use cases at the scenario level, in other words, quite detailed, or use cases at, at that, that collects groups of scenarios. And it's really um, kind of up to you. Uh, you, know, do, you, know, you, you have to sort of make sense not to leave out too much detail or put in too much detail. Um, so now let's talk once again about solution scenarios. So, so you take a scenario, which is one path through the use case, so the first component of a scenario is the use case itself. And then second, the second and third components of a scenario are what we call assumptions and what we call outcomes. Uh, so let's take for, you know, just for grins, uh, a login use case. So user logs into system. Um, there are at least three scenarios that I see here. One is user successfully logs in by putting in a user ID and password. 
Second one might be a uh, user is uh, unable to successfully log in because his password is incorrect. And the third scenario might be the user is uh, unable to log in because his user ID does not exist. Okay. So in each case, the difference between these three scenarios is the assumption. In the first uh, scenario, the assumption is the user has the right user ID and password. In the second scenario, the user has the right user ID but an incorrect password. In the third scenario, um, the user ID does not exist. Okay. Now, the outcome in each case is also different. The outcome is, in the first case, is the user successfully logs in. In the second, it's the user unsuccess unsuccessfully logs in. But the reason is different because of an incorrect password. So the scenario is different. And in the third um, scenario, the outcome is the user again unsuccessfully logs in, but that's because his user ID does not exist. Okay, so you can um, define scenarios or you can identify scenarios by varying the assumptions going into a use case, and each different assumption will give you a different path through the use case, which will result in a different outcome. Okay, so how do you create scenarios? As I said before, identify all the different you know assumptions and outcomes in the use case um, you know and techniques include you know talking to domain experts looking at similar examples so if you're building a reservation system look at other reservation systems if you're building some kind of dispensing device it could be a pest dispenser well look at an ATM example okay review the problem statement walk through case studies or storyboards basically just look at all the different ways the actors might interact with the system for a particular use case and you'll be able to identify the scenarios. Um, for more information look at the reference uh, from the IBM book. This slide is, uh, provides some guidelines on sequence diagrams. Um, once again as with scenarios note that we are using sequence diagrams to document dynamic behavior at any level of analysis domain problem and solution. Okay, uh, And it's a graphical representation of a scenario. Okay? You can, it doesn't have to be, there it doesn't have to be a one-on-one -on -one relationship between a sequence diagram and a scenario. You can use a sequence diagram to, to describe multiple scenarios all, you know, grouped into the one sequence diagrams, into one sequence diagram, or you can explore only the major scenarios and document them, capture them using, using um, sequence diagrams. Um, now, now, the, the interesting thing about a sequence diagram is that it can be used to discover or validate responsibilities for objects. So for example, um, let's say you did an object model to capture the, the static structure and then you know, generalized it into a class model and you identified um, what attributes and methods it might have or actually what uh, you know, data and what responsibilities or messages it needed to respond to. Okay? Um, you, you can then take the the dynamic behaviors within the system, the things that happen, the active things that happen within a system, and create scenarios out of them, and then create sequence diagrams that essentially interact with the same classes that you have in your object model or class model. And when you do that, when you take the dynamic behavior and start modeling that, you will start finding out that the classes or objects that you have need additional data or additional responsibilities. That's what we mean by saying we use the dynamic behavior or the modeling of the dynamic behavior, which is the sequence diagrams, to discover or validate class responsibilities. Okay, um, you will you you will identify uh, you know when you when you identify these class responsibilities, you will identify the messages that the object is supposed to respond to. You will also identify internal activities that um, that the object is supposed to uh, take part in. So you know self calls and things like that, um, and you've you've seen a di diagram of a sequence diagram before. So and sorry, an example of a sequence diagram before. So you know what the components are: the object, the timeline, the messages, you know loops, loops returns, internal, and so on. So you've seen that. Um, keep in mind that when doing analysis, don't don't get into um, don't get into details such as types of parameters, or, you know data types of parameters. Um, or even writing the messages as uh, you know function calls. Just keep the messages in English. Uh, you know, feel free to annotate. You know, stay at user observable behavior, etc. And here are some notes on object models. So as I said before, um, when you create these object models, use the sequence diagrams to derive and validate this. Use UML notation. 
uh, components of your object model will be class you know objects of certain classes you know relationships among them attributes and methods uh, one thing you will notice or one thing you will find helpful or one 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 hint you'll find helpful is that when you do analysis start with an object model as opposed to the class model this is because when you're doing analysis you're trying to understand the problem it's better to start with actual examples so for example if you're analyzing a university you might come to OSU and analyze it as a specific example and when you analyze it you might document the departments within OSU the colleges within OSU which are all objects and show the interactions between them and then generalize from there to the class of universities and the class of departments so when you document what happens at OSU when you're talking about the specific department and college and university objects what you're really creating is an object diagram yeah once you've completed that level of analysis you're then going on to generalizing it then you're creating a class diagram so the first step in analysis is usually a object diagram or object model and here's an example on a CRC card so CRC cards are nothing more than four by six index cards they're called class responsibility collaborator cards and you're seeing here one side of the CRC card so you see a, 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 the name of the class class name you have you have responsibilities listed there and you have collaborators listed on the right um, some CRC card techniques allow you to list collaborators on the other side as well or you might list the class name and the collaborators here and the responsibilities on the other side it's it's all up to you but basically the idea is um, you're capturing objects and classes on four by six index cards CRC cards may be used for more than analysis they can be used to capture design as well here is an example of four CRC cards describing the classes group figure, drawing, scroll tool, and selection tool, respectively. Most likely, these are CRC cards used to capture components of the user interface of a system. So how do you go about doing analysis? Well, the process is that you, you focus on the target of analysis and you focus on understanding, not focus on trying to solve, a, uh, solve any perceived problems in that domain so when you do domain analysis just focus on understanding the domain you know don't ask questions like well why don't you do this to solve it other than to figure out why it's solved the way why things are done the way they are done um, do not introduce design in other words and this 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 directive is especially true when you start going down through the levels of, of analysis so for example when you're doing prob problem analysis stay with doing analysis of the problem don't get into design the reason is that if you get into design too soon, you might um, remove certain alternatives. You might not consider certain design alternatives that actually might be better. You might get too focused on a solution quickly and come up with a suboptimal solution. The second uh, guideline is to be iterative and in incremental. You cannot understand the whole domain or the whole problem or the whole solution um, at one chunk. Um, because as you solve the problem and present that solution to users and to yourself, you will come up with, a, a, you will actually understand better what, 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 else, what else needs to be solved or whether you've solved it correctly. So the goal is to be, just like with everything else in software engineering, be iterative and incremental. Uh, and also, by the way, um, be, be scenario driven. Okay. Um, and what might be some techniques? So, so techniques are you would you could reuse existing model like the like Porter's model, um, like your value chain analysis. Um, there's there's also a, a model known as the component business model that we didn't discuss in class that can be used to understand a domain. Um, another step in the analysis process is to simply just create a categorized list of things in the domain, basically the now and then break those that categorized list into nouns which you know become candidate objects and then the verbs which become candidate responsibilities um, for these objects uh, note that I'm heading, taking you down an object oriented uh, path with respect to analysis so when you extract your objects and you ex extract your verbs you're ex extracting your objects and responsibilities you're assigning responsibilities to objects you're identifying relationships between objects and once you you know start to understand the static structure you you document that in what it, you know most likely a class model or an object model okay and then as you start understanding the dynamic structure how 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 or sorry the dynamic behavior 
of of the system that you're analyzing you know when you try, start figuring out how things interact in that system um, then you would capture that using uh, diagrams specializing in dynamic behavior such as the you know UML sequence diagrams collaboration diagrams activity diagrams and, and so on there is also known there is also a technique known as the CRC card technique um, for doing analysis and essentially it's a method for socializing the process of analysis so what I mean by that is um, analysis is a group activity you would sit together in a room with the different stakeholders and you would come to a common understanding of the system um, the CRC card process is a systematic way of coming to a common understanding of the system using um, class responsibility collaboration cards it's an object oriented way of of doing the analysis process interactively in this slide we cover a few useful guidelines with respect to doing analysis to begin with you have to make it an integral part of requirements definition in other words don't think of it as a separate stage but do a little bit of requirements identification, do some analysis of it, come back to re reworking your requirements, you know, things like that. Secondly, analysis is often a social process. So model with others, have active stakeholder involvement, display the results of your analysis publicly, and, you know, do your best to create collective ownership of the, 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 the insights from analysis. The third thing is you can't know everything from the, from the beginning. So you've got to model and, and analyze in small small increments. Sometimes you have to create several models in parallel and then merge them. And lastly, um, don't fixate on the on the tool, such as a UML tool, to collect, do, do your analysis. Use simple tools. The, the goal is to increase your understanding of the, uh, of the system uh, and its context, uh, not to use a, not to get involved in uh, a complicated tool. We close this lecture with a review of what we've learned. Basically, we, we will revisit the learning outcomes and go over how we covered them. The first learning outcome was be fam familiar with the concept of analysis. We covered this by explaining that analysis is all about understanding and at multiple levels. The second learning outcome was to be familiar with the techniques for analysis and the capture of analysis. For this learning outcome, we briefly described several analysis techniques. The third learning outcome was to be familiar with analysis work products. For this, we described and gave examples of work products in which to capture the domain problem, the domain, the, the problem, and the solution. On this slide is a list of references for analysis. Analysis is quite an important part of the software development lifecycle, so you will see that the reading material available on it uh, is, is considerably larger. Note that, the, that only the first reading assignment is mandatory. <laughs>